This is such an honor for all of us, but for me in particular, I can't tell you how much it means to be with you today. Um, and to make sure that your story is heard and understood. And to think that you were just 15, just 15. You decided to challenge a system that at that time seemed like it was written in stone. What were you reading and learning in school? What were you hearing at church that gave you the courage to challenge the system in that way? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good, uh, good morning, uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, being our, well, at the, uh, years ago, we were called colored and Negro, but I had always heard these stories of all our injustices mm -hmm. that was, you know, by neighbors, the minister, and just all African Americans was talking about all this injustice. But what start, what gave me, uh, well, let me go back, back up. It was an impulsive act. I did not. So you didn't wake up that morning. No, Saturday I did not this. wake up that morning and right. said, <laughs> yes. Uh, remember, uh, February, at that time, I don't think we just celebrated for, it was just legal for a week. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a full month. But because I went to a segregated school, the faculty members said that we were going to celebrate it for the whole month. And that uh, there was no books in the uh, school library, only Britannica Encyclopedia, and I think there was only two African American, at that time we was called Negroes. Uh, there was Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver. Okay. And so my, so, uh, my instructor, by the faculty, uh, Mrs. Geraldine Nesby, and another faculty member, Mrs. Josephine Lawrence, uh, the faculty members always said they was very unorthodox in their teaching methods. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Nesby had us to write essays. And most of the essay was about Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver. But my essay was about what was happening locally. Okay. And so that was one of the things. And so I said, uh, that day when I, uh, am I getting ahead of you? I don't know. Uh, oh, that's all right. We're right here with you. Uh, that evening, uh, we got out of school early, and so instead of staying on the school campus because nothing was happening, mm -hmm. we decided to walk on downtown and uh, browse around. But instead, we saw our uh, bus coming, and so we decided to, we boarded it. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there wasn't many people on the bus. So they said, uh, as she read, as the uh, young lady read, uh, there wasn't many people on the bus, and they asked for my seat. Mm -hmm. no, and instead, they asked for the four seats for just one lady. So, so they the, said, all of you get up so this one, one lady, lady can sit, sit down. down. Yes. So I said, no, that wasn't right, because we had been discussing it in class about all our injustices. And so, but the, uh, I just have to tell you this, the boys was into, more interested in Jackie Robinson because he was, he was breaking the baseball mm -hmm. barrier. <laughs> and, but I was interested in what was happening in Montgomery, Alabama. One of my classmates, Jerry Marie's, was on death row for supposedly raping a white woman. Mm. And so uh, another thing, we was, had to get up and give white people to see just the, not an elderly woman or an elderly man, just to show that they were superior than, uh, and we was inferior. So that day I said, uh, when the bus people asked me, said, why didn't you get up when the bus driver asked you to get up? I said, you know what? History had me glued to the seat. <laughs> And so, and let me tell you, he said, why, how is that? I said, well, it felt as though Harriet Tubman's hand will push me down on okay. one shoulder <laughs> and so John a true hand will push me down on another okay. shoulder. <laughs> they kept you right there.
All these years later, do you still remember what it felt like to say no? Well, as a teenager, see, we was on the bus and I wasn't breaking the law. The three other young ladies got up reluctantly. They just drove themselves back and stood up. So I said, well, it's my time, right, mm -hmm. to, make my, to say no. And so as a teenager of mine, I was only uh, talking to the bus audience, those people that are saying, oh, you got to get up because it's the law. You got to get up. And one of the, one of the teenagers, that, one of my classmates that was on the bus, oh, she don't have to do nothing. Uh, her, the lady's name, I still recall the lady's name. Her name was Margaret Johnson. So Margaret Johnson said, oh, she doesn't have to do nothing but stay black and die. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the students, the bus driver, um, well, make this long story short, approached the uh, uh, court square. That's like a little mini depot where you make the connection buses, uh, connecting bus mm -hmm. to, uh, going in your direction. In the, uh, uh, so, the traffic patrolman came on the bus to the back door and asked me to get up and give this one white lady a seat. And I said, no. And he said, and I said, repeat, it's my, I paid my fare and it's my constitutional rights. And so he yelled to the bus driver, oh, we don't, I don't have any jurisdiction here. So by being a little mini depot, we thought that it was over. At least uh, all of us thought it was over. With. And what happened that gave me the courage? The student knew they had absorbed what the instructors said, what we had been talking about all of February. They didn't jump up and flee from the bus. They stood right there with me. And so that gave me the courage to sit there. That is one of the strongest arguments for Black History Month that I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and the importance of knowing your history and being inspired by your ancestors. Um, and can I just make one observation? Yeah. Isn't it amazing how she name-checked everybody? <laughs> like, you know, you remembered every detail of the story. There are a lot of um, young people here, and, and frankly, you know, some people who are up in years also, who don't fully understand what it was like to live in segregated Alabama. When Marley read the story and talked about lynchings and talked about a color line that was just impossible to penetrate, when is the first time that you understood as a young person? Because you, m my family's from Alabama also, you get that lesson early from Birmingham and you understand early that there are things that you can do and places that you can't go and it doesn't feel natural. It goes against the natural law. When did you as a young person understand that the Bible told you one thing, the Constitution told you one thing, but the laws in Alabama said something that didn't make sense. Well, it was my, it was first lesson come from my parents. My parents, and, and okay, going back with my first experience, as much as I can recall as a child, well, back in uh, Pine Level, I don't know whether it still exists nowadays or not, Pine Level, Alabama. <laughs> The rural pine of Alabama was at the general store. And at the general store, if you all don't know, you in New York, a general store, everything. <laughs> <laughs> a general store, everything is there. The post office. The, uh, where you get your ice. You get, you, back in those days, we didn't have, people didn't have refrigerator. They had ice box. Well, that's where, you know I'm going way, way back. <laughs> and uh, you, you get your shoes, you get your grocery, just everything. The bus depot right there, the bus stop right there. Everything is right there at that general store. So the little white children was running. Well, we wasn't allowed at a very early age to learn from your parents all the do's and don'ts. So we wasn't allowed to run in and out of the store. So I had, I had my little, I recall, I had my little pennies. I had five pennies tied up in the corner of a handkerchief. 
because we didn't have first like little change first like the kids nowadays like in rule five level. You tied them up at the end of the little handkerchief. I had five pennies, and I was gonna take my little five pennies and go. I was just thinking about you could get two cookies for a penny. <laughs> I gonna get a lollipop. I was going to get a Mary J. I was just naming the little things oh, that I was going to get, you for, you gonna get. get for, for my little five pennies. So the little white boy and his little friend, they was older. They were laughing, laughing. And so the little white boy, he was about my age, he ran up to me and he, he looked at me and he looked at me and said, I knew the little white boy, but we wasn't allowed back then in those days. I don't even know the little white boy's name, but I know his parents' name because some of my mother's friends worked for them. But no, no, I didn't know the little white boy. I can remember he had a little sandy brown hair. That's all I remember. And he had little blue eyes. And he held his hands up. He said, let me see your hands. And I held my hands up against him. And he laughed and he pressed it up against me. I, I believe my mother said those older children had told him something about my mm. hands. But to this day, I don't know why that little boy asked to hope. And I had contact with that little boy's hand. And my mama gave me a backhand slap, pow, right in the forehead. <laughs> And his mother didn't notice, she didn't notice it. And then she turned around and she said, oh, Mary, that's right. That's what, my, that's what she told my mother. And then I was crying. I ran out the store, I forgot all about what I was gonna get. And I was ran out the store crying. And I went home and told my father, I told my uh, adoptive father, Q.P. Carvey, I told him what his mama had did to me in the store. And they explained to me what, then they explained to me all, of, all the things that I wasn't supposed to touch the little white kids. But, you know, as little children, we had made eye contact, and we had did, we had, had made eye contact, but you wasn't supposed to touch a white child. So I learned that was my first lesson. Mm -hmm. And isn't it amazing how a child knows when injustice exists? A child knows that in a very special way. You know, a lot of children today are learning about your story. Yes. A lot of people in this room are learning about your story and your name for the first time. But it is a travesty that your name has not been exalted in history books, that it has not been lifted up. <laughs> and we are so glad that we are able to tell your story today. And, and claim your rightful place in history. And this is a, a difficult question to ask, but I wonder how you dealt with that for so many years, knowing that you helped shove society along through your courage, and yet your story was not told. Well, it's a long story, and I don't have time to, <laughs> right here to, <laughs> to explain to you. See, it's not just a one-day thing. That's what everybody don't understand. It's every day, every minute, every second. You're not gonna change the complexion of my skin. And I have to deal with it. It's in different forms. Uh, you have the word for it when you know it, when you don't have to deal with it. I don't forgot now the word. But anyway, it's not direct. You know, you don't deal with it directly, but you deal with it. And when you confront it, you know, uh, you know not to have so much anger, and for the one thing, they always say nine months before Rosa Parks, but they, don't ex they never explain who was the person, you know, why was I Claudette Carver nine months before Rosa Parks. Lately, they had said that nine. But I tell most of the people are my coworkers too. And um, I didn't even explain to them because most of my coworkers are I'm a level 99er. I have to plug that in. <laughs> uh, all, most, the majority of my uh, co-workers was from the Caribbean. And I have to tell, that's why I have to go into this. And I didn't even let them know that, I, I didn't even let them know that I had participated in that. We did a lot of protesting again. I remember Doris Turner, when we first got uh, the, uh, the nurses' aid mm -hmm. into the union under the leadership of Doris Turner. 
And um, we did a lot of marching and protesting and going to Albany and all of that. So that was the economically part about it, you know. And when most of the people that do, these kind of, do uh, this kind of work are uh, people of color, you know. We have a few uh, Eastern European, but mostly people of color. So uh, um, anyway. But you, you dealt with this over years. Uh, oh, staying, years, 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 years of knowing. And one thing about it, I have to interject this. Rosa Parks was a friend of my biological mother. Mm -hmm. And so, we, you know, wrote Mrs. Parks in her very genteel way. She was very quiet, and long as long as Rosa was carried, telling the story, it didn't it didn't bother me because long as someone get out there and tell the story, you know, about our event. That is um, incredibly gracious of you to to say that as long as someone is doing the work. But we're glad that we know that you were doing the work. And we're glad that we were able to tell your story. And I ask everybody in this room to use your networks and use this day to lift up her name. Use those devices that I know you have in your pockets and your purses um, to tell people about the story of Claudette Colvin, Claudette Colvin and her place in history. Thank you so much for being Thank with us today. You.